This evening I'd like to read the entire 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, a familiar text. where he instructs both his disciples and then some Pharisees that uh, come into the picture. John chapter 10. Christ says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. Jesus therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hireling and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hireling and not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life, for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. There arose a division again among the Jews because of these words. And many of them were saying, He has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, These are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of one blind, can he? At that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews therefore gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. 
For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word came, of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. And many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. As I said before, this is a sermon, and in one sense I'm sort of uh, saddened to give this sermon today, the last day of the year, because in one sense I want to exhort you into setting the tone for next year. Uh, I did not have that sermon prepared when it came time to submitting the information for the sermon today, and so I hope it's not perceived as this is sort of some Christmas leftovers that you're getting. But um, I hope that we can uh, reflect something of the Christians or the Christmas season. Uh, and I wanted to uh, remind us, as we do think about this new year, of some of those things that Christ told us, why he had come to this world. Uh, in the series, we looked at the fact that Christ said that he had come for judgment. On one occasion, he said that he came not to bring peace, but to bring a sword, divisions among families. And then on another occasion, he spoke of, uh, do not even begin to think that I've come to abolish the law. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. And he told us a great number of things about why he had come. And, and this evening, I want to think about another passage where Christ tells us clearly in spades, in verse 10, that I came that they may have life and might have it abundantly. That he has come to give his sheep, according to this passage, eternal life. Uh, the point here that we see is that Christ comes to lay down his life. He comes, that is, to die. To die for a purpose. To die for the benefit of his sheep. Comes, in the language of scripture, to lay his life down in their stead. It's the language of sacrifice, where one person or in the Old Testament the animals suffered a death that the individual worshiper deserved and Christ as the good shepherd is also the lamb of God slain from before the foundations of the world that he is the lamb of God who takes away sin and so we want to think about something of this passage, about how it is that, that Christ comes to give his sheep life. I want to think about three aspects of this text. First of all, that Jesus lays down his life willingly. Jesus lays down his life willingly. You notice what he says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then in verse 17 and 18, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And notice, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. 
this commandment I received from my Father. That Christ willingly lays his life down for the sheep. And if we understand something of the picture that the Bible paints of us sheep, I, I, I think of that uh, dog, you've probably seen the picture on uh, the, the world's ugliest dog, he's won it like three years in a row, this you know, sunburnt, uh, shriveled up, hairless dog with warts and teeth sticking out, he's blind, he's just this hideous sight. And in a sense, that's really the picture that the Bible paints about sinners. That we are blinded by our sin. We can't see anything lovely in Christ because sin has blinded us. We're deaf. We can't hear the words of life. That our arms are the proverbial shriveled up, shriveled up arms that we can't embrace Christ as he's offered in the gospel. And in a word, we're spiritually dead. We have a heart of stone that is incapable of pumping that life-giving blood that gives us sensation in life. And it's these lifeless, sin-cursed creatures, these sheep, matted with sin, that Christ lays his life down for. Now there's an admission by Paul. He says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone might lay down his life. That if we were good, it might be conceivable that Christ in his virtue might want to die for us. We have the example of John Knox who wanted to die for Wizard because he believed Wizard's talent and his ministry was so valuable that he'd rather lay down his life that Wizard's ministry could continue. And it's possible, it's even happened in history that that is the case where people have been willing to lay their life down for one who is good and noble. But Christ suffers that torturous cross undergoes an agonizing death on behalf of sinners. And we have to ask, why would he do something like that? And the answer, in a word, is love. An ineffable, unfathomable, unsearchable, sovereign, divine love bestowed upon creatures who are not deserving. A love that we, quite frankly, don't fully understand. This is what John was getting at in John 3.16 when he said, God so loved the world quality of his love that he gave his only begotten son. And this speaks, you see, something of the character of Christ who would willingly lay down his life for us. And we must never lose sight of that motive. A kind of love that changes sheep from wandering sheep to following the Good Shepherd. A love that ought to make each of us scream out the words of Alexander Means. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul. To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. That love is something that changes lives. 
And when we think of this, as Christ comes willingly to lay his life down for the sheep, this next point that I'm going to make is in no way in conflict with that love. You see, the, the broad evangelical church has that right. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe on him might have eternal life. He loves the sheep. But my next point, you see, which I believe the evangelical church misses, that Jesus lays down his life narrowly. That's my next point. He lays it down willingly, but he also lays it down narrowly. And this truth is evidenced in the text, the language of the text that we're looking at. You note in verse 11 and verse 15 that he speaks about the sheep. In verse 16, he tells us that there are others that are not of this fold. What is he speaking of? Is he speaking of those who will not be saved? I think not. One of the passages that I find an interesting parallel, and you may want to turn in your Bibles to John 17, here's in context, is the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you look at verse 20 there, you notice something that I believe is the parallel of what he was getting at in John 10, 11, and 15, and 16, where in John 17, 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who will believe in me through their word. He's speaking of converts who will come to faith through the apostolic mission. As the disciples share the gospel, the Gentiles will come to faith and they will join the one flock and have one shepherd. There are others that must join the fold. But you see, he makes another distinction down in verse 26 and verse 27 of John chapter 10. You may keep your finger there at John 17 as well because we'll go back to there. But in verse 26 and 27, you notice that he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. Oh, excuse me, I missed my... I started in verse 27. He says, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. You are not what I am going to title my sheep. That class, my sheep, you're not of them. My sheep have certain qualities. So you see there's a distinction between my sheep and those who are not my sheep. And if you look in verse 9 of John 17, you'll notice that in the same way, he says, I ask on their behalf, speaking of the disciples, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. Christ prays for his own, that there are those who are his sheep and those who are not in this passage. And Christ says that I am coming to die for my sheep. You see as well that this is evidenced in the activities of the sheep. If you compare verses 27, that the sheep are people who are marked by hearing the voice of their shepherd. And the shepherd knows them. And they follow the good shepherd. And in verse 26, where he says, You do not believe because you are not my sheep. And there, if the parallel is drawn, belief has to be seen if we're comparing Verse 27 to 26 says, as hearing the voice of God and following him. An act of faith. That obedience is always the fruit of salvation. It's not a matter of coming to belief and then living your life any way you want. But the sheep are obedient to the voice of, of the shepherd. 
And so there are two categories of people that we must see. And Christ says, I am laying my life down for that category called my sheep. You are not my sheep. Conclusion, I am not laying my life down for you. And so he lays his life down narrowly. The third point, that Christ lays down his life savingly. And here we see something of the particular redemption of Christ. That Christ came to accomplish a work of salvation on behalf of his sheep. You see, the debate in church has been, did Christ make a provision for salvation accessible by all men who, it is assumed, have an ability to choose Christ? Or does Christ die for a category called his sheep in this passage, his elect? Is he laying his life down for a narrow group of people who have no abilities and then enabling them to freely choose him, empowering them to respond to that supreme love. And of course, the reformers believed it was the latter of those two. In fact, Pelagius was the one who uh, early on in church history argued uh, that man could not, uh, or that God would not demand something of man that he didn't give him the abilities to do. And so Christ comes, he tells us, the purpose of laying down his life is to secure eternal life for his sheep. Again, you might just think about what he said in, in John 17 and verse 2 where he said, even as thou gavest him authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou has given him, he may give eternal life. It doesn't say to every man in the world, but to those whom you've given to me. To that group that will be set apart for my purposes, my sheep. And you see, when Christ, when we think about Christ coming into this world as the babe in the manger, we have to recognize that a purpose that he had to laying down his life for the sheep is something that is so monumental in history because there is no other human being that could lay his life down savingly for any sheep if he were born of Adam. And the doctrine of the virgin birth is no tertiary doctrine. That is so important to our faith because he did not have a sin nature. And so through the whole history of mankind, there's no hope on the horizon until one who comes who is born without a sin nature. And for the first time there is hope for salvation. One who could actually live up to that law for, for our salvation. And so that issue is very, very important for our faith. So when Christ dies, when he comes to fulfill that purpose in his death, we see that scripture unpacks the way we come to faith in that event and in the person of Christ as coming about by a sovereign act of his grace. And let me try to just unpack the key elements of that briefly by, by quoting several uh, texts of Scripture. And then I'll try to deal with some challenging texts. Uh, first of all, we, we note that God chose some people to spend eternity in heaven for the glory of his mercy. 
This is what Romans 9, 22 through 24 says, that what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and he did so, in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. Do you hear that echo of John 17, 20, and 10, 16? Ephesians 1, 1 through 14 is a text that I won't read, but if you want to go back and look at those precious first verses of Ephesians, it should be abundantly clear how it is that Christ has bestowed his mercy upon us and that God choosing us according to his mercy and his will. We'll look at a couple of those later. Second aspect is that God's choice for salvation was not on the basis of a decision made by man. Romans 9.16, so then it does not depend upon the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. It's not your energies that God chose you because you had exercised great religious energies or that you willed him to to save you, according to Romans 9. And even more emphatic is John chapter 1, verse 12 through 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of of the will of man, but of God. Now, the question is, do we choose God? The answer is yes. We choose God. But it's after He chooses us. We respond after He has taken that heart of stone and made it a heart of flesh. And enabled us, empowered us to respond, to hear, to see, to reach out and embrace him, you see. It's not ultimately on our will, but upon his. Thirdly, God did not choose believers on the basis of our good works. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Romans 3.28, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans 9.11-12, For though the twins were not yet born, speaking of Jacob and Esau, and had not done anything, good or bad, in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. You see, it was not on the basis of our good decision-making, our wisdom in choosing God. It wasn't anything that we had done. But on the contrary, that the glory would go to his gift, his grace. And fourthly, we see that God chose his saints before the creation of this world. 2 Timothy 1.9 Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Ephesians 1.4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him 
in love he predestined us you see fifthly God chose his elect according to the kind intention of his will here's Ephesians 5 through 1 5 through 11 he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself and just hear this echo according to his will according to the kind intention of his will to the praise and the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of time that is the summing up of all things in Christ things in heaven and things on earth in him also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things out after the counsel of his will now I know those are fast and furious and a lot could be said and more could be cited but you get the general picture salvation is of our Lord it starts with him he chooses us and we respond now with that said there are some challenging texts of scripture texts that the reformers and those who have been in the reformed tradition have had at their disposal and I hope that we can arm ourselves with something of an understanding and an answer to those who are genuinely trying to understand these texts because on the surface of them they they really seem like Christ died for everyone and so we want to see what does the Bible teach about the ability of man to choose God now we will hear it presented well God is a gentleman and he's not going to violate your will because for him to initiate love somehow becomes an intrusion that is unmerited and beneath God I, I really struggle with this idea of God because I try to think of the the image that the Bible gives us of the bridegroom seeking the bride and I think of the appropriateness of the the male seeking the woman and saying will you go out with me I'm gonna initiate something here and I'm gonna ask you do you love me or would you consider loving me you see to initiate that that relationship isn't somehow beneath normal behavior but somehow that has been pinned against God as if he were to somehow choose us first as his bride that that is somehow ungentlemanly beneath the dignity of God or maybe you'll hear it presented well God casts one vote for you the devil casts a vote for you and it's up to you to decide who you'll serve is it going to be God or is it going to be the devil and you need to cast your vote and I often wonder well if that's the case what if you never cast a vote where does that leave you see that's the agnostic hope and yet Christ you know steals that from you when he says if you have not confessed me you have denied me to sit idly to me is to make a decision that you don't want me you see so what does scripture have to say here's a challenging text that they will they will apply a number of these here's Joshua 24 15 uh, this is presented as uh, the God shows that man has a free will to choose who he will serve and if it is a disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord choose for yourself today whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served which were beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord Joshua 
saying, choose God or the pagan gods. 1 Kings 18.21, Elijah up on Mount Carmel, where Elijah comes near to all the people, and he said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Or, in the New Testament, perhaps closer to home, Acts 16.31 and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You and your whole household. Now what's at issue with all of these texts is, clearly there is a command to make a choice, to believe. And so do we inherently have that ability to do what is commanded of us? Now Pelagius said, yes, God would never make a command that we cannot fulfill. And I would highly recommend the book, The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther, if you want to understand what is at issue here. And in a scholarly and a, a, a delightful way, uh, Luther shows us that when someone makes a command, the imperatives, I can make a command on you all day long. I can tell each of you to go run a four minute mile I can command you to do that, but that doesn't mean you have the ability to follow through on my commands. Now the question is, is God of that character? I understand I'm a sinner. I can't project on God what is true of sinners. But then Luther shows that there are texts in Scripture where God makes commands upon his people that we cannot carry out. Be ye perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect, is a command. And I doubt that any of us would claim that we have the ability to carry out that command. And so you see, God actually demonstrates that he makes commands upon people that we cannot carry out. But now when we come to the indicatives of Scripture, those statements that say, this is the case, you did not choose me, but I chose you. It does not depend upon the man who wills or the man who runs. God gave them the right to become the children of God who were born not of the will of man nor the will of the flesh. You see, those statements all powerfully make the case that God chose man. And so all these texts say is that there are commands. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Choose who you will serve. Choose between God or Baal. In no way says anything about our ability to carry out that command. And so we're left with the indicatives that make the case plain and simple. There's the other idea that Christ came sort of to die and make a provision for salvation for anyone, that it's a free offer of the gospel. And the Reformed faith, we don't want to uh, argue that the genuine offer of the gospel, we believe that to be true. We just understand that deaf ears are never going to hear that. Unstopped, blocked eyes will never see it. Hearts of stone cannot feel anything for it. Withered arms can't reach out and grab it, you see, unless God interferes. So the question is, did Christ intend to make salvation just merely accessible, a provision? And here we would argue, uh, you know, as the case has been made, no. But they'll say, well, wait a minute. There are texts in Scripture like 1 Timothy 2.4 speaking about God who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn with me to 2 Timothy and we can see something of how careful Paul is in writing to his young protege. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we note how Paul uses this phrase, all men. 
he says in verse 1, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. And then in verse 2, he defines what he means by all men. For kings and all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, when it's put in its context, you understand he's not saying all men universally, he's saying all classes of men, even kings in high places. Now let's put this epistle in something of a historical context. This is written from his imprisonment in Rome. Paul is ready to have his life poured out as a libation, a drink offering in his next letter to Timothy. And what is happening while he's at Rome? It's interesting that he tells us in, in the uh, letter to the Philippians that many in Caesar's household are coming to faith. Don't forget to pray for Caesar's household, you see. We're witnessing and they're coming to faith. Pray for these guys. Because God desires even our political leaders to come to faith. Do you pray for President Bush's cabinet? Do you pray for Nancy Pelosi? Do you pray for our religious leaders to be converted? Our political leaders to be converted? That's what he's saying. That God desires these people to come to the knowledge as well. We have to ask as well, if God desires all men to be saved, what prevents that? Now, that really should settle the issue in a certain sense. Nothing is more sovereign than God. Nothing's more powerful. If God wants something to happen, it's going to happen. But so entrenched in this view of, of a provisional atonement are some people that they have actually been so bold as to say, our will is stronger than God's will. That we can hinder His grace. I, I, I believe that's blasphemy. That just simply is flat arrogant to think that finite creatures as us can actually thwart the will of God. Or they might quote something like 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow about his promises. Some count slowness, slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Well, what's happening here? God is pre presented somehow as being frustrated in heaven. He doesn't wish any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But somehow, people actually perish. People die. What's happening? Well, if you will note something of the context of Second Peter as well as First Peter, we note that in context, Peter is writing to the elect who are scattered throughout the land, the uh, uh, Jews that have been uh, scattered throughout the diaspora. And he's writing to elect saints scattered abroad and is trying to encourage them about the sufferings and the trials that they are undergoing. And that God is not going to take their life, but there are trials that are brought, but God is not willing that any of his elect, even though they're scattered to the hinterlands, should perish. And I believe the context of that passage is deeply important for understanding that statement cannot be taken out of its context. Or another passage they'll quote is 1 John 2.2 2, And he himself is a propitiation for our sins and not only for ours only but also for those of the whole world. Now again, does the whole world mean every individual in the whole world? Some people are saying you can go to hell and have your sins forgiven. That's actually a view that is being propagated. God already forgave everybody's sins. 
And some people go to hell because they've just never cashed the check. They've never gone in to the bank and redeemed it. They never made good on it. But that's not what this is saying. You see, the language of Revelation is that there are representatives of every tribe, tongue, and nation that will be there on that day. And so, of the whole world can also be understood without doing violence to the language of the text as representatives from every tribe, tongue, and nation, from the whole world that Christ died for people. You see, and that's how we have to see these texts. Otherwise, we do extreme violence to texts like John 17, John 10, the doctrine of hell itself that says there is a group of people that Christ came to die for, his sheep, who are marked by an obedience to him. Now, this doctrine is humbling. Because anyone who grasps this doctrine is not going to want to say, gee, I'm a pretty good guy because God chose me. No, it humbles us because we know that we are just as bad as anyone else out there. Why would he have mercy upon me when he's passing others by? He doesn't have to save any, but the fact that he wants to show his mercy, why me? That's a very humbling doctrine. But this doctrine is also very comforting because Christ tells us in our passage that none are going to be able to snatch us out of his hand if we are his sheep, and we are in his hands. And nothing strong enough to pry his fingers and that we could somehow slip out. Nothing's going to separate us from the love of God. And how Paul is so sweet in the epistle to Romans to show us nothing will ever separate us from the love of Christ. But what of those who are the coming under the hearing of this word today who stand indifferent to Christ I want to offer you three reasons if you are not Christ's sheep there are three reasons perhaps more but three that I want you to think about it may be that you find no beauty in Christ and you find no beauty in him partly because you're blind and partly because that's the way God designed it. Isaiah 53, 2 and following that says, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised, forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Isaiah's passage here rebukes those who miss the Messiah. Plain and simple. But he goes on to set a prophecy that has been the crown jewel of prophetic statements about the Messiah and his life and his death, his sacrifice and he corrects their misunderstanding of the Messiah and it may be that you just are blinded by your sin it may be that you don't recognize your need for Christ because you don't understand what it is that God is holy or the magnitude of sin and how offensive it is before God. You have deeply angered God and that one sin according to scripture is enough for God's judgment upon you. And you must see that your sin is alienating you from God. 
And thirdly, it may be that you just love your sin. You don't want to be holy. You love your sin more than Christ. And you say, well, I'll close with Christ someday, but right now I'm having fun. I just remind you of the, the young man or the, the elder man in, in Christ's parable that was going to build the garner. Build a bigger barn and store up his grain. Take his life of ease. Do you remember Christ said to him, You fool, tonight your soul is required of you. And what do you do? You don't know how many days you have left. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to respond to those prickings of your heart as the Spirit works through His Word to call you to repentance and to see the seriousness of your offense and to either refine the doctrine to what Scripture teaches or to just plain repent of sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, Christ came to lay down his life for his sheep. And I pray that you are his. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father,